Good afternoon, and welcome to session E04, minimizing your trips to DB2 in order to reduce your DB2 elapsed times and your CPU times. Uh, my name's Linda Clausen, and uh, for those of you that have never met me before, I've been around for a long time. I'm one of the dinosaurs. I've worked with DB2 since 1.1, and uh, I'm a frequent speaker at iDUG and DB2 user groups. Today's session will be covering potential ways of identifying those long running threads. So the first thing we need to do is find out on uh, identify those threads that have a very high DB2 entry exit number of events. The more times you come in and out of DB2, the more you're going to slow down your transmission and your overall process. We're also going to take a look today at coding techniques to minimize those trips to DB2. And in addition, we'll hone in on those specific coding techniques that will allow you to optimize your database, uh, distributed database access threads, your DBAT threads, and make optimum use of multi-row processing in the way you code your SQL, and also take a look at some of your bind options that allows for multi-row processing and for um, <clears throat> block shipping. Oops. All right, the first thing is to identify your DB2 threads. With high DB2 entry, any thread with a high entry exit point, it's a suspect thread. One that you may be able to tune significantly to reduce the trips to DB2. In addition, there are messages generated by DB2 for long-running reading readers, those threads that are long-running readers, and for those threads that have a long-running unit of recovery. In other words, uh, for those long-running updates, insert update or delete modifications, you will get message DSNJU031. Those are the applications you need to take a look at to see if they are doing the appropriate commit frequency. Now, <clears throat> the threshold for this is set by your system administrator. There's a DB2 startup PARM or ZPARM to control those unit of recovery log record write checks to check how many log records are processed and then start shooting out a message if you exceed that limit set by that ZPARM. Now the ZPARM is U-R-L-G-W-T-H. So you are for unit of recovery, L-G, log, W, write, T-H, threshold. And the system's administrator sets that threshold, and when you exceed it, you start getting these log messages. Now, the long-running readers, and please note, you're holding resources even if you are a read-only process. You're maintaining uh, data sharing uh, sysplex overhead because you have cross-system interest, uh, interest potential here. All right? So you'll want to look and see, watch for that message as well. So this is a long-running reading task, reader. Okay. You've done selects. You're not freeing. Please, on read-only processes, put in your commits. Free those threads up. Release those resources. Even if it's a read-only process. The only ones that don't hold your resources is those that use the with UR 
or dirty read, isolation level. So take a look at those long running readers. Either get a commit in there or have them use the with you are isolation level to cut down the overhead. <clears throat> the next thing, you want to do code review. Now, we can identify by looking at our code those potential applications that are going to be doing a lot of DB2 entry exit points. It's much better to identify those up front before they ever start than it is to do it after the fact. Now, I'm sure all of you have adequate time to do these code reviews. Yeah, that's what I thought. Now, just comment. If you take about 15 minutes to do a nice quick code review, it could save you hours after the fact. Once it's in production, it's a lot harder to make changes and to get the time to make the changes. But if you are already in production, the way to identify the potential long-running units of recovery are to take a look at your accounting trace and look at the class one application time. If you have a high application class one time, then that indicates you have a long running unit of work. And you can break that down to see if you have a high number of entry exits by looking at the thread, overall thread entry exit with your class two entry exit report. Now that's if kid 232. Or at the package level, if you're gathering the class 7 trace information for your accounting trace, that will give you the package level entry exits events. Okay? And again, both of those, you, uh, your entry exit is acquired through your accounting class if kid 232. These entry exits, these high entry exits, you can reduce the overall lapse time and the time in the application by looking at those entry exits. And those with high entry exits are candidates for using things like row set processing and reviewing how the actual SQL is coded. All right. Now you can get, if you take a look at your accounting trace report. Now, uh, most of your third party trace uh, or accounting performance tools will give you the equivalent type of reports. So what you're going to want to do, and this is at the thread level, class two, overall application plan level. Take a look at your class two entry exits. You've got a high application elapsed time. Look at the entry exits and if the entry exit is extremely high, equivalent or greater than the overall and probably just a little bit, almost identical to the total number of data manipulation language statements or SQL statements that are executed, you know that for every SQL statement, you're going back and forth from application to DB2, application to DB2. That back and forth, dispatching, invoking that, is a high overhead. You will see that the actual SQL statements, such as inserts and your fetches, will add up to the DML statements. What you want to see is, for example, on your fetch, you want to see maybe 10 fetches and number of rows per fetch be maybe 100, which will decrease the overall number of DML statements and the number of entry exits. 
<clears throat> you've implemented, in other words, multi-row fetch, row set processing. You're grabbing multiple rows with a single fetch instead of just one. So you need to look at the rows returned for the individual SQL statement. <clears throat> When you do your code for your review, you want to minimize those trips to DB2, those entry exits. And the ways you do that when you're doing code review, looking at your COBOL program, you're going to avoid any unnecessary SQL statements, such as selects before a delete or selects before updates. Those are unnecessary. Take a look at your perform loops. Do you have a singleton select inside the loop for your fetch? Could that singleton select be outside the loop and be performed once right before you open the cursor and then you go into your fetch loop? A lot of times I see, just because of the nature of where it is coded in, in your logic, that you're doing unnecessary singleton selects. The next item you want to take a look at are your code, your, are your joins coded appropriately? Or for some reason, are they coding application joins? Now, when I'm talking about application joints, that's where they declare a cursor, <clears throat> prime the predicate of the declared cursor, open it, fetch one row, <clears throat> then use the contents of that fetched row <clears throat> to provide the values to open a second cursor on a second table. Then they go into a fetch loop to fetch those rows. When they're done fetching against the second table, they close that second cursor, come back to the first cursor, fetch the second row from the first cursor, use that to open and fetch through all of the second table rows. Guys, that's that is vSAM processing. That is not SQL. That is not relational DB2. Code your joins in a single SQL statement. And the old archaic rules that we had before version 5 of DB2, way back in the beginning, where you only join two tables or three tables, no more than three tables in a single join, those rules are out the door. I have coded as many as 14 tables in a single complex SQL statement. I've been able to join up to 14 tables and get sub-second response time and convert a three and a half hour join to sub-second response. It's all in knowing your data, coding your SQL appropriately for the join, and have the appropriate indexes for those joins. Filter everything in your where clause that you can. Join your tables. Don't put so much in the application code that you drag the relational environment down. Okay. Also, use output only updates and deletes wherever possible. Put the filtering in the where clause. <clears throat> don't select in advance if you don't have to. The only time you would select before an update would be if the content of the current row decide, makes the decision whether to update or not. And most of the time, even that logic could be in the where clause of an output-only update instead of selecting first. And wherever possible, use row set processing. Hand DB2 an array to work on instead of single row process. 
take full advantage of the row set processing. Now, to be able to do row set processing, you may also need to make sure that your developers and your application code understand the usage of extended indicator variables. That's a critical part of the newer releases implementation of performance. Now in version 10, as of version 10 I should say, we have the ability to use extended indicator variables to guide DB2 what to do during inserts or updates. Can be dynamic or static. And it allows you to code one update or one insert that includes all the columns each of each time instead of have multiple updates because it's a different set of columns within that table. Make everything static, one static insert statement, one static update. And then in the logic before the statement, take a look and see which columns you want DB2 to just use the default values for and which columns you want to, on an update, for example, hey, just ignore that it's in the list. Now that means that every column you're referencing in the values clause, in the values clause, you have to have an extended indicator variable. Whether the column was defined as nullable or not, you need an indicator variable. And you will set that indicator variable according to what you want to do. Zero if you want the column updated or provided, taking the value from the values list. Okay? Or the variable from the set in the update. A negative seven if you want it ignored in your update. A negative five if you want DB2 to use the default value for the column as the default is defined in the table definition. Okay. <clears throat> then those applications you will bind or rebind with the bind option extended indicator variable yes. So you are able to provide the appropriate example. Let's assume for a specific insert, although it provides an address column, there you want it to uh, assume there was no address provided or you want to specifically tell it to use the default value for that column. So you set the indicator variable that you've set up in working storage to either a negative five or a negative seven. Then in the insert, DB2 will either ignore it or use the indicator variable to tell DB2 what to do with that address column. Now note, when you have the indicator variable on, the contents of the column is not transmitted. So you're also reducing down the amount of data passed if it's a negative SQL code, which is just an indicator to DB2. If you want the address to be utilized, the content of the variable to actually be used to overlay the address column in the table, then you would move a zero to the indicator variable. And then during the update, the value is actually provided. If you want a column to be skipped and ignored in the update set, then in that indicator variable, just as we see with the salary here, you would put a negative seven. Okay, no value provided. Okay, skip the column, not transmitted. Okay, 
So indicator variables an important part. And an important part of reducing entry exit is row set processing. You can use an array, let's say in COBOL, if that's your language of choice, and set up an array, let's say an array of 100. You will set up an array for each of the columns and say each of the columns occur 100 times. Then you can turn around and do a fetch, a multi-row refetch. It means DB2 is going to grab 100 rows out of the result table and move it into your occurs. So you have transmitted with one entry exit 100 rows to populate your array. Or you can fill up your array and do a multi-row insert. So with one entry into DB2, you've passed 100 rows for DB2 to insert before it comes back and said, OK, I did it. This can reduce the overall calls. In addition, upsert. Okay. You can use your merge to reduce the number of trips in and out of DB2. If you need to look at the contents, the old contents or the, or the new, you can do a select from the update. That will reduce. Now, to be able to use row set positioning or row set processing, you also need to understand the Git diagnostics. Because if you're doing multiple rows with one trip to DB2, DB2 may need to pass back to you multiple SQL conditions, negative SQL conditions, exceptions. And that's the purpose of the Git diagnostics. Okay. All right. Now, when we start looking at our multi-row processing, I want you to stop and think. Now, we can do one trip to read DB2 and return, say, 100 rows using multi-row fetch. We use the array and the syntax and in our working storage, we're going to have to set up an array of 100 for each of the columns. And have a variable we can use for our counter. Now, you could put a hard code literal in there, uh, integer in there, but variables are the best. So your We're moving plus 100 to n, which is our number of rows we want. Now we're going to do the fetch next row set from our cursor for our number of rows, which will be 100, into our array of 100 for each of our columns. If any of the columns are nullable or you're using extended indicator variables, providing a indicator variable, you will need to set up an array of 100 for each of your indicator variables. Now, these arrays are at column level or variable level, I should say. For example, you will set up a column an array for each of the columns in the table that you're going to be selecting. So now in our work area, you will see that we have our column one array, our column two array, our column three are a wet array. Column three is a nullable column, so we set up an array for it, the null indicator. Then we declare our cursor, select our columns from our table, in the cursor, it's cursor with row set positioning. So DB2 is aware of that at open time. Okay. Before the fetch, you will prime your count. Then you'll fetch next row set from your cursor for 
your row count that you want, number of rows you want, into your arrays. Okay? And that way, with one trip to DB2, you can return 100 rows moved into that array. The positional moves. Now, if you have less than 100, you will get a plus 100, and the number of rows will be in your, of your last fetch will be in your diagnostic area for your statement, how many rows were returned. Okay? You will need to, in your condition, grab a hold of your SQL ERRD bucket number three or rows returned if you're using just the SQL CA. And you're going to have to have a fetch within a fetch because you're going to do your fetch of what your 100 and then you're going to create a loop to process however many rows were returned. Your number of returned rows. Okay. So for the plus 100, okay. You turn your end of flag on. Otherwise, you'll do your whatevers. Do your normal process, and then you will vary your subscript, displaying or moving or processing each of those host variables until the subscript is greater than what was returned. Okay? And then we're out of there. So we've processed the last row, number of rows returned. So loop within a loop. Multi-row insert. You're going to prime or fill up. Here we're only doing 10 rows. I prefer 100 and then do a commit. But I'll uh, prime my array with my 100 values. And again, the array at the column level. And then set the appropriate indicator variables for each one of those. Make sure my number I'm going to insert is populated, whatever that is, 10 or less. Then I'm going to insert into my table, my columns. Values are my array. Okay. Four whatever number of rows to tell DB2 how many rows are represented. You need this to be atomic, not atomic, sorry, <clears throat> continue on SQL exception. So if one of the rows has an error, it's not going to automatically roll back all of the rows. So each individual inserted row will return its own condition. If it's an exception, it continues to the next row, and if that one's good, it'll go ahead and insert it. Which means after you've performed this multi-row insert, you ne need to check your diagnostic area to see which row did not perform. And then make the decision whether to commit the ones that did or roll all of them back with a rollback. Okay. Now, think about this insert. If you're going to insert with a singleton insert, read one input, move it to the columns and insert, that's 100 trips to DB2. Insert, insert, insert from kicks or your batch program or whatever. <clears throat> In the instance of using an occurs of 100 for your row set, 
and insert with one trip to DB2. You insert 100 rows and then return. What do you think is best? 100 trips or one? Also consider you have the load resume yes. Multi-row insert <clears throat> performs closer to a load resume yes share level change than a singleton insert. Of course, load resume yes can do a few other things. If you can use the load resume yes for large volume, do it. If you need a large volume insert and you want to make it efficient from a COBOL host language standpoint, use multi-row inserts. How about the merge? How many times have you seen, oh, I'm going to select this, and then if the SQL code is zero, then I'm going to update, else if it's a plus 100, I'm going to do an insert. Why? The merge is what is meant to be used for that type of scenario. <clears throat> so you're going to set up a merge to your table, provide the values, compare the table content, to the new value content being provided for the new content. When we match, we do the update. When it's not matched, we do the insert. One trip to DB2 instead of two with a potential condition code handler in between. So, got our trips in half. We can also do multi-row merge. We can set up host variables, and then we can use merge using four, and in this instance, five. So we're going to provide five rows, and again, not atomic, continue on SQL exception. And for each of those five rows, DB2 is going to do the lookup, see if the item is in the table compared to the item in the array. We need a, this, this uh, you know, we're using the variables, the values coming in as new item. This is the correlation ID for the variables. This is the correlation ID for the table. Okay, I is the correlation for the table. When we get a match on that comparison, we do the update. When it's not matched, then we do the insert. So, one trip to DB2, five rows processed. If any failures occur, you'll get back an SQL code 253 or 254 at the end of the merge. And you will need to take a look and use your get diagnostics for the statement to see how many conditions were returned with the number. Okay, total conditions you need to handle out of the five, how many failed. Okay, and then turn around and perform a get diagnostics of each of those individual conditions. Okay so that you can retrieve back the detail, the SQL code, the SQL state, etc. What row number was it? And these will be in reverse stacked order. The most current first, the first one that occurred will be on the bottom of the stack of messages. And then you can display those messages in your COBOL or whatever you need to do. Okay, so get diagnostics at the statement level to find out the number of conditions. Okay. And in the individual conditions can be performed as a loop. Okay. Delete processing. 
Um, are you doing singleton deletes, one row at a time? Are you using a update cursor, cursor for update of, and then doing a search delete, deciding whether to update or delete? Or are you doing an output only multi-row update using a where search condition? Or are you deleting everything from the table? Now, if you're going to delete multiple rows, just delete where search condition is true. If you want to clear the table, don't use the delete from table without a where clause. Either use the truncate, which is an SQL statement, truncate immediate, which, I mean, as soon as you say truncate table, table name immediate, boom, it's gone. It marks it as reusable space, which performs almost as well or equally well as to the load replace with an empty input data set. Okay. You can also, if it's a large volume of deletes, consider using the reorg discard. And the next time you reorg your table space, you will be removing those purged records. So for purge processing, if it's an entire table, use the truncate or the load. And for a large number of row purge, consider the next reorg using the discard option. Use your standard delete to get a limited number of rows to be deleted because of the logging overhead. Okay, truncate. Now, a lot of times we want to return the modified data. So let's assume we're doing an insert and we're using a sequence where DB2 automatically generates the sequence number for you for the unique identifier of the new row. Well, you want to see that. Well, you do a select from the insert. So DB2 performs the insert and returns to you in the final table select the value it assigned. Or when you're doing an update, you want to see the after update entire row. You can do a select of the entire row after the update or select from the final table after a merge has occurred. So you see the contents that was either updated or inserted. If you want to look at the, this is after the process. If you want to look at the before process on a delete or update, you can use select from old table before your delete. So there's really no excuse for writing multiple SQL statements when one trip to DB2 is enough. Okay. Minimizing your trips to DB2. For your distributed. Now let's assume you want to make sure that enablement of Block fetching occurs in your distributed apps. To promote block fetching, you can define your cursor is for fetch only. And you can say optimize for a large number of rows. Now, in Local applications such as CICS. <clears throat> so you have Kix transaction. And you know the result table of the declare could be multiple rows, but you only want <clears throat> a small number, not a large number. You can turn off access paths or influence DB2 to turn off, disfavor access paths that would create a large result by saying fetch first. Optimize for one row 
fetch first row only, something like that. Now that is the reverse of optimize for a large number of rows. When you say optimize for a large number of rows, <clears throat> then you're telling block ship, DB2, influence, you're distributed. As long as you have subsystem parameter, extra server blocks, it can fill up the multiple blocks to ship them back. Continuous block shipping, fetching, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> can also be accomplished if you're using, um, if you have a ZOS client to a ZOS server. So DB2 to DB2, and both are ZOS. So if you've got a ZOS client and you want it, the, you want to bind that package where you're going over to the other DB2 ZOS server with database protocol DRDA CFBF, CBF. Okay, so block fit shipping database enable for uh, where ZOS is client and the server. Okay, you can also do a fast and uh, implicit close. If you say fetch first X number of rows only, when the last row is returned to the client, it can do an implicit close of that cursor for you. Now, be careful <clears throat> because what you want to make sure they really don't want any more rows because you've done an implicit close of the cursor. In version 11, you can also create something called a data type. You can create an array data type. Okay. Now, the array data type The array data type can be used in native SQL procedures to provide an array of values of the same data type. And it can be a variable array because they may be giving you a list of items. And then you have to use that to get the items you need and return to the client. So take a look at the new array data types for your native SQL procedures. And you want to move as much, much SQL from the client to DB2. You want to take full advantage of your stored procedures in your distributed. Now, in your distributed environment, network traffic becomes critical. Doing those single SQL statements across the network can bring your network to its knees. We learned that a long time ago. So we need to make sure that most of the processing is at the engine where the data is stored. So the best way to do that is to put all your SQL and the processing associated with that SQL where the data lives. So we've broken our process in half. On the front end, we receive the request, we validate the input, we provide that input to the server where the data lives by calling a stored procedure. The stored procedure then receives that, processes the data, and when it's all done, returns back to the caller. One request in, one request back. And then we display our results. Now there's two definite flavors of stored procedures. You have your external stored procedures. They've been around for a while. This is your typical, um, it's your typical COBOL, routine that has all the SQL statements in it. You use COBOL reentrant code coding techniques. You define it to DB2 as a stored procedure and, a, and assign it to a workload manage address space. 
and you put those definitions in the DB2 catalog. Then when the client calls the stored procedure, DB2 looks in the catalog, sees that it is a COBOL stored procedure associated with workload manage address space. It will load it in from the load library, execute that as an allied request, going back and forth to DB2, executing all the SQL from the COBOL program, COBOL stored procedure. And when it's done, it'll return that to the front end user. Now, you will have a high entry exit into DB2 from the stored procedure in the workload manage address space for the stored procedure client or stored procedure package. You have the package in DB2 and you have the COBOL here. So you'll see those entry exits at the stored procedure level. Now, to reduce that entry exit, you can convert that to a native SQL procedure. With a native SQL procedure, all of the if-then-else logic, procedural logic, as well as the SQL itself, is stored in the package of the stored procedure. So that bytecode is loaded into Database Manager and executed internally in Database Manager. You have taken away all of that entry exit from the stored procedure program executing workload manager address space to DB2 database manager. Also, if it's called from a distributed application through DIRTA, through TCP IP, please note that that execution code can be offloaded to the ZIP processors, which is a cheaper processing unit whose cycles do not go back against the DB2 license charging. And in addition, another advantage, the shared communications blocks where database manager puts the result to ship back to the client is in shared storage. And both database manager and DDF, the distributed data facility, the IST address space has access to that. So there's, I put it there, you read it from there. There's no moving between address spaces of the data. And then that communication block then goes out across the network. Now, to promote that process and to keep overhead to a minimum and reduce your locking, want to review your binds. Now we can bind, the normal bind is cursor stability current data, no. If you have application interfaces that can afford to do dirty reads, please bind them isolation level you are. Okay. Database protocol. Dirt a protocol, private's no longer supported, hasn't been for the last couple releases. Now there's a new one in version 11. So if you have a version 11 client to a version 11 subsystem DB2 server, DB2 to DB2 on the cross the ZOS platforms, you can also use the DB protocol DRDA CBF on your bind, okay? And you can get connections to use package-based continuous fetching or retrieving result sets from your DB2 for ZOS server, okay? Also, we are look, really promoting thread reuse so we don't have to build these threads and to get the best level of reuse is the release deallocate, okay? And then we promote you putting your commits in to free resources so these threads are reusable. 
Yeah. Release deallocate means those reusable threads will stay around longer, but you freed up your locks and everything else with the commit statement. Release deallocate. And you can avoid certain, in certain applications, you can bind with current access resolution. If you don't want to wait for a uh, data modification, a uh, uh, insert, or a delete, you can tell DB2 to use the currently committed version. So if it's a delete statement, you'd get the row before the delete is committed. So you'd get the old content. For an insert, it won't exist. And if you do those items, reduce your overall number of entry exits to DB2, then what you should see is a reduced number of entry exits, seeing multiple rows processed per single fetch, multiple rows processed per single insert, multiple rows processed, multi-row updates, instead of everything at the fetch count level. You will see the distribution and reduce the overall entry exits to your invert. So review your times. Look at your entry access. Review, test, test, monitor, test, monitor, test. To get this down to a reasonable level in DB2. And we have some sample results here. We took a process that was um, opening a cursor against a base table. And for each row fetched, inserted a modified version into a global temporary table. And when they were done, they opened the cursor on the global temporary table with return to client. And it ended in, in 820 milliseconds. Now, please note, this is the second reading of the execution time. So each one of these scenarios where we took the second reading to make sure we were having the buffer pools primed for each execution, okay? Of the 530 rows processed. We looked at that and said, well, there really was no reason to do a cursor on the input table. We could just do a mass insert into that declared global temporary table, applying the modification of the data we were selecting in the select list. Okay, doing the what if game. So a few more CPU cycles for the insert, but it still beat the cursor way and above. So we mass inserted in the global temporary table and then opened our cursor against the global temporary table, passed it up back to the caller, reduced it to 570 milliseconds. So we saved about 250 milliseconds. Now the final process was, well, what do we really need that global temporary table for? We don't. We can do the open cursor against that select that contained the modification of the data, symbolic what if modification, and just return that to the caller to reduce the overall down to 290 milliseconds for a total savings of 530 milliseconds to process those 530 rows out of over 50 some thousand in the base. So ask yourself, if they're using things like global temporary tables, are they really necessary? Why did they use them? Make sure it is because it's necessary not because they just want to create a global temporary table because it's something new. Or they want to throw it in a scratch pad and perform the logic in COBOL when it could have been performed in the select list, in the select itself. So good coding practices really do reduce the trips to DB2. 
So review your long running units of work. Perform your code reviews. Avoid any nice unnecessary SQL. Look at your perform loops. Remove move application joins and do multi-table SQL joins and make sure they are tuned and explained appropriately. Use output only updates and deletes wherever possible. Look at row set processing. Do multiple rows at a time. So your COBOL programs can achieve what we have implicitly done with read only processing at least in the distributed with block shipping. Look at your accounting traces or equivalent. Look at the number of times you enter and exit DB2. Compare it to the number of SQL statements executed. Okay. Look at the overall performance. And now, any questions or discussions? I want to thank you today, and it is important to fill out your evaluation. That is session E04, and there's a lot of good sessions. This is only the first day, and we have a lot more to follow. Thank you very much.